Lovely to see you. How are you? Hi, Tom. Good morning. I'm doing all right. I'm Thanks glad, for having me. I'm glad you're doing all right. Now, I, I want to talk about your work, but first I want to talk a little bit about you. I heard that your parents owned nightclubs. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, in Mexico City. They had disco nightclubs, they had salsa nightclubs, and they had drag queen uh, nightclubs. Now, were you allowed to go to these nightclubs when you were a kid? You know, I used to be super proud of this because I spent so much time in these clubs. I was seven years old and spending time with Rudy Calzado and Celia Cruz and all of the salsa stars. And now I go to psychotherapy because it's not okay <laughs> to, to send your kids to the nightclubs and the discotheques. But yeah, I grew up among strobe lights and changing uh, color, changing lights, and it it I think it informs part of my of my practice. I really like to throw a good party. I that's that's kind of where I was going with it. Is that like you know so much of your work involves gathering of people and people interacting with light and people interacting with things around them. Do you see a connection there between what your parents did for a living and what you do? Totally, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of artists that work with light as a medium, but most of them have this approach that is about enlightenment and spirituality. I come from a different tradition of light. For me, the light of the discotheque is the light of disorientation, is the light that allows you to hide, to be someone other than yourself. So there's this capability that we have to go into a space that is completely different from normality, and you can interrupt your the normal way that you go about relating to others. And I think that art is a little bit like that. It's called that artifice of going into a space that is kind of changed by a bunch of effects or a bunch of um, projections or, or, or light beams, and it, it, it it forces people to sort of reconnect with each other and to re-establish uh, uh, relationships between them. I never thought about that. The same way that when you walk into a nightclub, you feel like you can be someone else, someone else for a couple of hours. It often mimics the way I feel when I go to an art gallery. You know, I get to be a different person. <laughs> I get to be a different person than I am when I was outside. Well, I mean, I think art art is like this kind of interruption. It's this kind of opportunity for us to think about, you know, uh, in this case, COVID or separation in a different way, right? Like it's a platform for people to come together. And as you said, that's a big part of what I do, right? Like most of my work is interactive. Uh, participation is not only um, in, in invited, but but fundamental to the existence of the artwork. Like a lot of my works um, are activated by cameras or by sensors, by microphones that pick up the activity of the public. And then that becomes the artwork itself. So if you have no public, there's nothing to show. That's the kind of work that, that I do. Well, I'm excited to talk to you about that in the, in, the, in the world of the pandemic. But first, I guess we should talk about the show itself. It's called Cercania, right? Yeah, Cercania. It's a Spanish word that means proximity, except in Spanish, it also has something about a certain intimacy and complicity. So I like to, to keep it in Spanish just because it's missing some of that in both French and English. Can you, br I mean, this is very challenging to do over the radio, but can you briefly explain to me what it is, something about it? For sure. For sure. So at the Arsenal Contemporary Space here in Montreal, uh, we decided to do a residency, an artist residency. It's an exhibition, but it's also going to be changing over time, over the next three months. And it's basically a 20,000 square foot space. It's really gargantuan and beautiful. And we've put, put 12 audiovisual artworks um, that have been chosen specifically for social distancing. So while most of them are immersive and interactive, there are no buttons, no levers, no surfaces to touch, um, no hermetically sealed chambers where people get asphyxiated. That's an artwork that I showed at the Museo d'Art Contemporain a couple of years back. I've seen that you one, yeah. That's, that seems like a good pre-COVID yeah. exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not a good artwork for where we are at right now. So we chose those for, for social distancing, but then the subjects and the, and, the, and, the, and the material itself that we have is like, for example, there's an experience where people's shadows um, are tracked and overlapped. So even though you're keeping social distancing, there's this constant sort of uh, overlap between two people or we're mixing people's portraits together. Or in another artwork, we extract their heartbeat with a camera, a thing called photo um, photoplethysmography. Um, and so we extract the, the, your heartbeat just by looking at you. And then we send you to a three-dimensional artwork, which is online. And in fact, anybody from anywhere in Canada or the world can participate. It's going live tomorrow. It's called unpulse.net. And if you go there, the camera from your phone or your laptop takes your heartbeat and it adds it to this database of other heartbeats that are live in the piece. And then you can chat with one another um, 
with a representation of this kind of, you know, vital signs of all of us joining into this kind of uh, virtual shared space. Yeah, you know, so, so so something techniques- that seems more and more important as we as we seem very far away from from one another. Exactly, exactly. So for us, it was a luxury to work in such a big space because we could guarantee that if people come to the show, it's a timed entry and we can uh, keep enough distance between different participants. Um, And then at the same time, I think it's super important at a time when we're all bubbled up into our Zoom chats or, or just at home quarantining or so on, to have an opportunity to be outside to... um, allow you know a space like this to bring people together and have a shared experience uh, so i think i think it's a it's it's a it's an approach um for interactive art it's not common that there is this kind of don't touch don't uh it, it's all just camera based but it i think it's going to work because of that uh, i want to talk about the heartbeat in just a second but but i, I kind of want to talk about it in the grand scheme of a couple of things in this show i was wondering if you could Tell us a little bit about the, I believe I'm pronouncing this correctly, the paradolium. It's this big yeah. circular drum that audiences will walk up to. Can you explain that to me? For sure. So that's a fountain that is basically like a water basin and you go down and you look at it. And as you do, um, there's a little camera that does face detection. So the computer basically sees your face and then it actuates, it activates uh, hundreds of ultrasonic atomizers, um, which convert the cold water into plumes of vapor. So for a brief second, um, your face, your likeness, gets appears in this cloud of artificial vapor in the water, and then it, it ephemeral, it, it, it disappears after a second or two. So pareidolia is the capacity, the capacity for our brains to see faces, like in clouds mm. or in burnt toasts or whatever. So we take the phenomenon of pareidolia and we create it in a fountain so that your likeness is created with this water vapor. It reminds me of the story of, of like Narcissus, right? Go looking into the looking into the water. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's kind of and it also makes tangible the atmosphere, right? So uh, a lot of my work lately is about how do we, you know, sort of relate to our atmosphere, which is our biosphere and in terms of environment is important. But at a time for example where Right now, the atmosphere is trying to kill us through COVID or through climate change or the accumulation of carbon dioxide. We live in an unprecedented 422 parts per million of carbon dioxide. No human ever had ever lived under so much carbon dioxide. So the idea that the atmosphere is is beautiful and it communicates our thoughts and our songs, but it also has all of this... um, you know, sort of um, issues that we need to be aware of. So for me, to work with vapor, to work with the atmosphere, it's a way to make tangible the medium through which we live, you know. And in this case, it's, it's a very temporary likeness of, of the person looking at the, at the fountain. If you're just tuning in, my guest is Raphael Lozana Hemmer. He's a, an artist who makes big interactive installations that pe- bring people together. His latest exhibition in Montreal is called Circania. So we've talked about... Um, you know, water vapor, we've talked about transmitting heartbeats to one another. Um, in a second, I want to talk to you a little bit about your your project at the border. And and we talked, we kind of hinted earlier at your piece about getting into uh, a room and, and, you know, breathing other people's air and asphyxiation and all that. <laughs> Are you ever surprised that people agree to interact with these things? <laughs> Definitely with the, with the asphyxiation chamber, because basically that's like a hermetically sealed glass room where you're invited to breathe the air that has been breathed by everybody before you. And there's like massive warnings. Like it says, warning for asphyxiation. You only have like 10 minutes of oxygen. A warning for contagion. There's no filters. You're sharing viruses, bacteria, pheromones, everything. Another one is a warning for panic, because in order to get in and out, you need to go through a decompression chamber. So when I made this work, I thought, you know what? No one's going to go in this, but it's kind of like an aquarium. It's kind of like an experiment. I'm okay if no one goes in. And when we showed it here at the Musée d'Art Contemporain, and we're, uh, we've shown it in about five different countries, there's a lineup and everybody wants to go to, to feel what it is to breathe this recycled toxic air. And I think that that's really interesting because in the end, oftentimes when we hear about participation and new media and so on, everybody's talking about, oh, you'll participate, you're, you have agency, you have the power and so on. But in this piece, if you participate too much, you die. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like a, a perversion of the concept of participation as something that is necessarily positive. Um, and crucially, if you're in that work, 
you make it, make it more toxic for future participants. I should clarify that this piece is, on, you know, not on view. It's supposed to yeah. be on view in this. I, I, I guess the reason it's I'm interested, right in, but the reason I, I, now. I bring it up is that all those things I mentioned, sharing your heartbeat, uploading your heartbeat online and sharing it with, with other people, you know, stepping into a room where you're asphyxiated, um, uh, you know, looking into a face and, and getting your face in, in water vapor. I know I'm doing a very uh, deconstructed version of what these things yeah. are, but it takes a certain level of discomfort. And I'm wondering, you as an artist, like, what do you get out of making people uncomfortable like this? It seems like you're very comfortable with it. Well, it's kind of like there's a, a Zapatista slogan back the Mexican activists. They used to say, you know, we're not asking you guys to dream. We're asking you to wake up. And I think that art is a little bit like that, right? So there, you, there is a place for art to, to be oniric and beautiful, and it kind of interrupts your concerns and it gives you something like uh, um, Matisse used to call it, yeah, it's a comfortable chair where you can sit on. But then there's also a role for art to be activists, right? To um, work to ask certain critical questions about the moment that we live in. There's an artwork at, this, at, the, at the show Cercania which is basically an upside down noose, which works as a metronome. And it's this noose um, moves every 10 seconds, which is approximately every time that someone in North America gets shot by a gun. And so by bringing um, these kinds of thematics that may be social or philosophical or historical or political, you, you kind of make the works current, right? It makes you, it forces you to think about data. It forces you to think about the idea that this is all not neutral and beautiful, but there's also some serious concerns. And those concerns have to do with surveillance. They have to do with the erosion of democracy. They have to do with uh, Black Lives Matter. They have to do with how we're tracked, compared has to do with like all of the major issues of our time. I think that artists react as citizens and they want to ensure that their artworks are current with those concerns that they have. So for me, the discomfort is a part of, of, of um, Brian Nino used to say that in a perfume, you always have to have like a pungent smell because that's the one that captures your attention. If it's all sweet and fruity, it's not going to be a good perfume. A good perfume has to have a little bit of a, a punch. Isn't that interesting, though, that Eno ended up making such ambient music, you know, ended up making this music that was that was was played in sort of the background you were supposed to ignore. And yet he was so fo <laughs> focused on getting your attention. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I'm, I love I, I'm excited to talk to you about um, Circania, but I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about this piece you did a little while ago that really got my attention. and I think a lot of people's attention, too, which was Border Tuner, which was on the, uh, a part of the border between the United States and Mexico. Um, could, could you tell us a little bit about that? For sure. So um, between El Paso, Texas and Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, this is a sister cities that have been together as a single community for hundreds of years. Even before the United States existed, Ciudad Juarez and El Paso were one single city. And right now they're actually the world's um, largest binational metropolis, at least on the Western Hemisphere. And so you have um, people who have coexisted for a long time, um, which have family on both sides. And now you get to a point where there's a very adversarial nationalist narrative of building borders and walls and, and Mexicans are rapists and, uh, and, you know, they're dogs and they should be shot in the legs. I'm just quoting the president of the United States. And under this kind of direct under this kind of adversarial regime. When we think about the border, we think of it as a very scary place. And yet, when you look at El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, this is a very integrated community um, that has an interdependence. They have relationships that are economic, uh, historical, environmental, social. So what I wanted to do is, how do we make an artwork that um, completely forgets about this division and creates uh, a way to connect people from from both sides. Um, and and the idea is to not so much create bridges between the two cities, but just to highlight that those bridges exist. So we put this massive searchlights of the kind that you find at a rock concert or a, at the Olympics um, to create bridges of light in between participants on both sides of the border. And there was actually six stations, interactive stations. You would get to a station and, and turn a little wheel like a dial. 
And as you did, the searchlights would scan the horizon. And when my lights and your lights intersected in midair, the computer would know it and automatically would open up a channel of, of bi-directional communication. So now I could speak to you, you could hear me, and I could hear you. And if I didn't like what you said, I would just tune, <laughs> to, tune you out and look for somebody else. Um, Tom, it was incredible. It was, uh, it was a parade of people over 12 nights in November who would show up and do, I, I call it a really bipolar project. Because sometimes you'd have like people, families, for example, who were being reunited through the piece. So it was super emotional. Other times you'd have like people flirting with each other or serenading each yeah, other. Yeah, the flirting when one I, caught me off guard, you know, like when I found <laughs> out that people were fl flirting across the border with one another. I, I, that, that struck it was me. really great. And they were, because you don't see the other person, you just hear their voice. So this, usually there's like, well, how old are you? And so on. And what's your Facebook? And then it's like, why didn't you come to Mexico? It's like, well, I'm afraid. And then she would say, well, you know, I. If I, if I take you around Mexico, maybe you would like it. Yeah. <laughs> and then she asks him, are you handsome? And so it was just really fun. But but then the, the grooming parts, like we had indigenous communities, for example, right? So we think of the border as English and Spanish, but there's the Ende families, the Tigua, the, the people who have been there for thousands of years and their voices were being spoken. Or we had refugees. Or for example, one time we had a guy who was actually a U.S. veteran of war the Vietnam War, and he had been deported to Mexico. And so it's just this array of um, of social and and not just sad stories. We had like uh, a lot of poets. We had a lot of historians. We had LGBTQ night with an incredible wrestler. His name is Cassandro El Exotico. You know how in Mexico our wrestlers are always have a theme? Mm -hmm. His theme is drag queen. Right. So it's a drag queen wrestler and he's talking to another wrestler on the Mexico side who's a German wrestler. And she says, you know, I'm here to tell you I'm from Berlin. I'm here to tell you that walls come down. Mm. And it was just like people, you know, applauding on both sides. It was just so beautiful. I, I, uh, I loved it. What, what I find interesting about it is that it's both technological and it's not like it's both it's both using technology and it's also just what we do together. Um, uh, and have conversations. And I love the way you put it. And I want to talk about that in a second, the idea that we're not building bridges. We're just looking at the ones that are already built. I, I yeah. we, we are talking over Zoom right now. During this pandemic, so many people have been using technology to communicate with one another, to talk to friends and family back home. And uh, speaking personally, and I can speak for a lot of people, also renegotiating our relationship with technology. I've tried to spend a little bit less time on my phone, a little bit less time on social media. So as someone who so many of the opportunities you create, so much of the artwork you create is made possible through technology, what are your thoughts on that, on the drawbacks of technology to connect or perhaps the advantages of it? Well, I mean, I always say that I work with technology not because it's new or original or futuristic or cutting edge. I work with technology because it's inevitable part of our society, right? So when you look at your your economics, for example, where most most economic transactions today are made between machines through globalized networks of communication. If you look at communication, right, like most of our communication, especially during the pandemic, is happening through media such as just a phone or, or a Zoom or whatever medium. Uh, if you look at relationships, if you look at politics and how elections get controlled by social media, um, you realize that in order to speak about our contemporary moment, you really don't have an option because we live in a culture of technology. Um, I'm a Mexican, but I studied in Canada. And in Canada, there is that lesson of Marshall McLuhan that technology is a second skin. It's not a tool. It's not something that's optional. It's something that forms part of ourselves. So to investigate with technology means to investigate ourselves. Um, so I call it normal. I call it natural. That's the way that we, even if you're a painter and you don't work with technology at all, your public is has an average of seven hours of screen time a day between phone, internet, and and TV. So so you cannot we cannot imagine what we were like before technology you know it's kind of like this idea of like when they tell you like the structuralists were trying to imagine what it's like to think without language well we don't know because we got language so technology is the same it's not it's a part of us and i see it um as coherent to to try and work with it to deal with the issues of our time uh, last question on that is 
we the the heartbeats, you know, us communicating through our our hearts and our, uh, us communicating through breathing each other's ear, us communicating through speaking across the border are all. Uh, I was going into this thinking the idea of art building bridges, and one thing you said earlier that really caught me. You said I don't feel necessarily like I'm building bridges. I'm paraphrasing you, but um, yeah. but I feel like I'm p- pointing out bridges that are already there. And I think something that's coming out of this paramedic, sorry, paramedic, something that's coming out of this pandemic okay. and this moment of of global uprising is that perhaps there are more there are more connections than we are led to believe by corporations perhaps there just are more bridges that we're more aware of so just finally can you talk to me a little bit about art's ability to build bridges or to highlight bridges that are already there yeah absolutely one of the biggest ones and perhaps the one that is not easy to quantify or to or to commodify is mourning right so art is really good to observe a solemn moment of coming together in the uh, at a moment of of loss, which undoubtedly the pandemic is. So mourning is not something that you can profit from. It's something that is evoked, best evoked by poetry, by by dance, by music, by by presence. And I think that ritual and the ritual of coming together is healing. And this healing is not about communication. It's about communion. It's about how do we share, and not religious communion, just like normal human pack animal how do we re-enter our groups and, and, and address our losses? And then, so that's on the one hand, the, the, the idea of mourning. And the other one is in terms of, of continuity, right? Like um, to understand an artwork that has a life after you're gone, like you leave a record of yourself mm. and then this piece will, will remember you. And in that memory, there's something about a validation of our existence and a reminder that we're here only for a brief moment, right? Like um, the call it in Latin, memento mori, right? Remember that you're going to die. And I, as Mexican, perhaps this sounds a little bit stereotypical, but I think about death a lot. Mm. Um, in my in the, in a recent article in the New York Times, they called me the death-loving crowd pleaser. <laughs> and I like that a lot because it is. It's, on the one hand, I want the public to get something out of these shows. On the other hand, I do want them to reflect on, on you know, how ephemeral it all is and, uh, and how we need to you know, marvel at the majesty of nature and the unknown, you know? So I'm a scientist originally, so I'm not a religious person, but to me, art, some people complain, well, art is the new religion. It's not so much that. What is the new religion is complicity. What is the new religion is looking at another person's eyes and feeling a sense of empathy and connection. Um, I think that we can build something on that. And it's not necessarily humanist because it's also understanding that the issues are much bigger than Mm -hmm. just relationships between two people. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I can't wait to somehow socially distance and and see this <laughs> see this piece you've been working on. Thank you so much. Please do come down. It's up till November first. I uh, I love talking to you, Raphael. Thanks so much for your time. All right, take it easy.